Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ones Ready Podcast. Jeez, it's weird looking at me without a hat. Anyway, uh, on this next episode, we have Laura Gordon. She is a deep end fitness coach, therapist, and overall awesome person. I had a chance to sit down with her and, and after a pool session with Deep End Fitness and, and talk about everything that is involved with that and those pool sessions and the, the kind of benefits that you get out of it and all that kind of good stuff. I did my best with the editing because where we were at, it was a little bit noisy. So hopefully that doesn't come through and bother you too much. But before we get into that, make sure you go check out drinkhoist.com. Use the promo code ONES READY to get yourself some nice a discount on some hydration stuff. You can also up your caffeine game with Cardomax at cardomax.com. Use the promo code ones ready. And then of course you have 18 alpha fitness coach Edgerton designing tailor-made plans just for you to get ready for the pipeline. And that promo code is the number one ready. And then you can obviously go to onesready.com. Not only get our merch and some shirts and stuff like that, but you can also get a tackle gear to help you train for the pipeline. No promo code needed at all. Um, so, and, and then we obviously have the membership that you can take advantage of. You can get the three different tiers. You know, if you go with the big boy tier, uh, on, which is called team tier, you can actually get a free per piece of merch, um, every six months, and then you get access to all of our content. So we appreciate you joining us. Enjoy this episode with Laura Gordon. She's fantastic. And man, I really hope we get a chance to have her on again. Later. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Once Ready Podcast. I'm sitting here with Laura Gordon. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I appreciate uh, this morning. Uh, yeah. People won't realize unless I actually get the footage from Paul and if it's of this session <laughs> that I got my ass handed to me this morning uh, in a deep end fitness pool session. So thanks for bearing with me during that. Yeah, absolutely. That was spicy. That was a spicy session for me as well. So I'm glad that you got to join us. <laughs> well, if that was spicy, then that's not too bad for me. Then I'm, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I think across the board, everybody got humbled. Everyone. Well, considering that, you know, uh, during one of the iterations, Paul was like, okay, hey, you know, you're, you're going to go stop 15 seconds each line across the pool. <laughs> and then after everybody's kind of doing all the bobbing, all the lines, you know, delaying for five, 10 seconds. It was like, you know, we're just going to cut this one short. That's 15 <laughs> seconds per line. That uh, last just, round, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just don't worry about that. We're going to call that one. <laughs> so tell us about yourself. Um, so my name is Laura Gordon, and I am a psychotherapist here in San Diego. I work predominantly with first responder and military populations. And a way that I really like to reach out to these communities, build relationships, and help them to understand the experience that they're having a little bit better is through the use of nervous system regulation and helping them build an understanding of what's going on physiologically in their body and how that manifests mentally. Okay. Yeah. And how long have you been doing that for? Uh, this past year, I got my master's degree, and so I'm stepping into the community. I was working for a year during my doing my clinical practicum at a site uh, where we were fortunate enough to work with first responder and military populations. So fairly new in the game, but already having so much fun. That's and good. Yeah. Well, thanks for helping us out. Yeah. Because we're a bunch of, you know, <laughs> we, we range from being broken, degenerates, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different stuff. Yeah. Or some of us just have nothing going on, or we're just a little bit naturally a little bit unhinged. So <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Unhinged is a, is a funny word. I get a lot of clients too, who say that they are hingeless because mm. unhinge implied that at some point they were hinged and they're like, I've been like this since I came out of the womb. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> All right. I'm here for it. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. pretty valid. Yeah. <laughs> so what, like what about deep in fitness? Like where, how'd you find out about it? So I used to do competitive CrossFit in San Diego and the gym that I was at Invictus got an invitation from Prime to come out and say, hey, we're starting up Deep End Fitness in San Diego. Would love to get some athletes like yourself out to a session, see if you guys like the stimulus, if you can take anything from it. And I like fell in love with Deep yeah. End Fitness at that session. I was like, this is exactly in my wheelhouse. 
I, as an athlete in general, am more internally competitive. And so battling the mental dialogue, battling where I'm at physiologically in a workout sparks a lot of joy. Um, and external competition as well does, does the trick. Um, but deep end fitness truly is the conduit towards that internal competition, mastering that internal dialogue. So that was my first exposure to it. And then as I was going through my master's program and I was learning more and more about somatic therapy techniques, I was like, deep end fitness, somatic therapy, same, same. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been incorporating that and I've been building out ideas and programs for how to reach these communities um, in a more relatable way. And it's been just yeah, an absolute joy. Awesome. And did you say how long you've been doing that for? I would say deep end fitness consistently for the last year and a half and then off and on for three years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It's a little bit difficult in the throes of like a more rigorous competitive um, workout regimen to have deep end fitness in if you're not great at eating because the caloric burn for those sessions is so high and getting my nutrition dialed in was something that I struggled a lot with. So trying to make sure that I hit numbers for a while came before going out and experiencing things. Um, but yeah. What, what, so were you finding that you weren't eating enough or yes. that you were really? I was struggling to meet the caloric intake that I needed, especially hitting certain macro numbers like for protein. And so working with a nutritionist, the idea that I would add on something else to increase my caloric burden. She was like, you're already struggling. You got to master this and then you can add on extra things. So I was popping in, in and out for a while. And then after I really got like understanding how to fuel properly under my belt, adding in deep end fitness was like the best thing ever. What were some of the symptoms, say, you know, for lack of a better word, symptoms that you were you were noticing about your nutrition where you just, you just didn't have the energy yeah. to, to make it through or were you at the end of the session, you were just completely wiped out or both, I guess. I would hit a wall pretty early on in workouts. I would say that that was something when I looked at my muscle density and when I looked at just how I could perform in a, on a day, particularly if I did eat well, uh, it did, it paled in comparison to days where I was not feeling properly. And so having that ebb and flow throughout my workouts and rather than consistency was just, um, was just something that I needed to really dial in if I wanted to continue to progress. Hmm, interesting. So, because I, I had a very similar experience when I was in QS at dive school. Yeah. Is I could notice, I don't think I had a pr the problem when I was at our selection, but when I got yeah. to dive school, yeah. um, you know, I, I would eat as much as I possibly could, mm -hmm. you know, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Um, but I could still see my swim times or my swim times increasing. So they were, there was, I was getting worse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And finally, one of the instructors pulled me outside. He's like, dude, you're not eating enough. I'm like, dude, I am filling, <laughs> I'm filling myself up mm -hmm. at, at breakfast, lunch, dinner. Cause we had a, a phenomenal chow hall with a great yeah. chef and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And he's like, dude, I don't care what you do, but you better figure something out yeah. or else you're just not going to make it through the course. He goes, set an alarm, wake up at midnight, throw down some, you know, potato chips, cookies, mm -hmm. whatever. So I know kid did that. Yeah. And, and it was like instantaneous mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the very next day mm -hmm. I, I could feel a difference. And that's, mm -hmm. it's just wild because your nutrition has such a big part of it. A huge impact. And then it, again, too, it, it holds the hand of new, of nervous system regulation so closely because when we start to look at what our body needs when we're in certain activation modes, so either our sympathetic or parasympathetic, in order to really go, right, when we're in our sympathetic fight or flight, we have to have glycogen stores at top notch. We have to have all of our electrolytes just firing on all cylinders. And so being able to prep for that in our parasympathetic while also taking in all of the content that we need to help restore testosterone, estrogen, progesterone in that parasympathetic is, it's an art. It truly is. And that's, I think, where I really see this developing to, like, just beyond helping people in the throes of their mental health, but then edging that outer threshold of performance. Dialing in those two things together is how you really pull together and then see progress or see improvement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's uh, it's extremely important. And yeah. one of the... <laughs> Going on to another story of mine, um, <laughs> I had actually had a, a, one of my, I guess, kind of mentors. He was a, a guy that was on the ground in 1993 in Mogadishu. Yeah. And like, he's, you know, just imparting a whole bunch of wisdom and knowledge on me one day. And, and, uh, he basically said, Hey man, 
like as somebody who has done done the the Mogadishu mile, yeah, and you never know when you're gonna bleed, eat, sleep, drink again. He goes, you always take the opportunity because you never know when you're gonna get a chance to eat, sleep, and drink some water. Yep. He goes because they, I mean, back in '93 uh, during that Mogadishu mile, they were they were in a hurt locker. Yeah. And uh, they were not prepared. Yeah. And uh, just kind of taking that and that. So that goes to that whole glyc glycogen storage and, and that kind of spike whenever you are in that fight, uh, fight or flight. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's cool to see when you do have access to that information. And so empowering people who have a sympathetic state as a part of their job description and empowering them and giving them that information. Like and once you had that under your belt, applying it and then seeing the improvement, it takes that mental aspect away of, oh, it's because I'm not good enough. It's no, no, no. I was fueling improperly. And now that I'm like, got everything ready to go, I can perform to the ability that I know I'm capable of. Well, I'll tell you right now, I fuel pretty good uh, <laughs> because I just stuff my face <laughs> and I don't worry about that now because I just throw down some food. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way. Yeah. So, um, we, we know, cause you know, you've been in the fitness world with CrossFit Invictus yeah. and doing deep in fitness. And yeah. you, I mean, it's, you've, fitness has probably been a pretty big part of your life oh, for cute. the entire time. Yeah. Um, so may, I'm sure you can answer this question, but as you, you typically see it more when somebody didn't really grow up doing fitness and then they started and they realized all the benefits that they, they had in their life. Yeah. So now that you're doing deep in fitness, you've been doing on and off for three years, really yeah. heavily for the last year and a half. Like what are some of those benefits, you know, both mentally, physiologically that you've experienced through deep end fitness? I think that's a phenomenal question because someone like myself who grew up playing sports and then physical fitness has been an integral part of every stage of life has, has led me to a path where I have chosen to not dive into emotional healing, emotional wellness, and instead I use fitness as a way to, to feel better and feel good a lot. A lot of seeking behavior, a lot of emotional avoidance, and I tend to edge more into those realms in order to cope with what's going on. And so with Deep End Fitness, what's really, really wonderful and kind of edging back into that idea of internal competition is that it really helps you foster and build the mind-body connection. And so when we start hearing that internal dialogue really loud on a breath hold at the bottom of the pool, we start realizing like, oh man, I've got some stuff going on right now. It can be that you show up to a session and a lot of stuff is going on in your life and you get to the bottom of the pool and all of a sudden you start hearing it at an amplified volume. Wow. And you come up to the service and you're like, okay, lots going on right now. How do I use and switch and flip that internal dialogue to help me right now? And so you get to the bottom of the pool and you're like, okay, this is difficult, but I'm capable. This is difficult, but I want this. I want to grow. I want to be better. And you watch yourself being able to build up another five seconds, another 10 seconds, and then surfacing back and then leaving the session and carrying that mentality with you, navigating the throes of life with a little bit more of that, um, I would say, centered mindset of, yes, it's difficult, but I'm capable. Yeah. Well, I mean, it. I'm sure you end up recognizing that you have a complete session one day that's just mm -hmm. bad you're just it's it's <laughs> tough to to get in the zone yeah um but i also think that it's it's important because it'll show you how to on those days like just that example that you gave yeah being able to for lack of a better word i guess deregulate yeah. yourself and go and recognize one recognize it mm -hmm. two is being able to control that and, and dial yourself back and then regain a control yes. and now move forward yeah. under a, a more, con I'm used controlled a lot, but a, a, more, <laughs> a more calmer and controlled yeah. person throughout the, the session. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that the, the use of the word control speaks to why this is so wonderful for populations like first responder and military is that that element in life is very important to us. And it makes 
like you feel very safe. And when we don't have that, like if we're sitting in a room alone with a stranger, somebody that we don't know, and they're asking us to open up about our feelings, it can be really dysregulating. It can be. And the goal and the way that we start to heal and progress and work through either mental obstacles or even some physical obstacles is starting to feel safe and capable in what we're doing. And so I think that Deep End Fitness is very niche in the environment that it provides for you to be able to be a part of a community you have that support you have that safety but you get to dial it in and have that a moment to work with that variable for yourself which yeah. is really empowering yeah it is yeah. It, it's like I I equate deep in fitness in the community that all of you have built you know I, I'm out in Vegas with Maki and, yeah. and I know you're setting up stuff um, out in uh, Hawaii yeah. and we've got a, a deep in fitness out in Tucson and it's it, like it's growing and it's awesome to see yeah it's almost like a, a grassroots CrossFit from back early in the 90s. Yeah. You know? And that there's something special about the, mm -hmm. the shared suck. Yes. Of going, not to say that these pool sessions suck, <laughs> but they're definitely, uh, they're definitely workouts and movements that you're like, you know what? This is, uh, this is challenging. This is this isn't yeah. necessarily fun right now. <laughs> Wait, what could we call this? We could call it purposeful suffering. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. In, yeah, in, yeah. In, a, in a community environment, which yeah. which helps that, you know, uh, to use a therapy word, a trauma bond mm -hmm. kind of thing. You know. Well, and so the. Um, the program that I did my master's in is uh, CFT, so couples and family therapy. And when you're deciding that you want to go into clinical psychology, you start looking like, okay, do I want to work with groups or do I think that mental health is best addressed on an individual level? And I made the choice for couples and family therapy because when I look at the power of relational healing and community beyond just a family unit, but like a group where you get to share in those experiences, I think that that is when the most emotional growth happens. Um, and so the idea was actually really planted in my head when I read the book, The Body Keeps the Score. Hmm, okay. And Vanderkolk worked with Vietnam veterans. And when he was with them on an individual level, he was really struggling to create connection. It was really difficult to create that moment of, I've got this person in a state of relaxation and safety where we can start processing. But when he brought together a group and they felt safe together, that's when when big moments happen mm. and they had that relational component. So I think that that community part of deep end fitness speaks to that and creates that environment where I've got the people around me. I have the instructors on deck. I know Laura's got eyes on me. Steve is in the pool safety swimming. I can go, you know, battle with those internal, that internal dialogue right now. And I can come up and know that I'm safe and supported, yeah. which is like, that's, there's something very magical and unique and I don't know where else it exists in the world. So I'm really excited to build and extrapolate on that. Yeah. It's, and I think you guys are, you are exploring that kind of stuff, like yeah. how to integrate that into into a therapy and a healing type session, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. So a goal for me at some point is to be able to offer deep end fitness as a part of group therapy. And with that, it means that you could get insurance companies to reimburse deep end fitness for the group therapy that's provided, making it a cost effective access, like an accessible option for individuals who are looking where they're like, I want to improve my mental health, but I also don't know if these traditional settings are going to cut it for me. And, and I, I feel like people are more empowered when they can say like, Hey, sitting with you, Laura, as my, my therapist is cool. It's great. But I just don't think that this is yielding the healing benefits that I need. And for me, like when I've had those conversations, it's been a prompt of, okay, how can I like create an environment where this person feels like they can tap into those greater levels of healing. Um, and so that's, that's very long-term goal. Um, but I think that we have all of the right balls in motion right now for setting that up at deep end fitness. And I'm really excited to see what we can build with that. Yeah, I, I am too. And in any way that we can support that, we would, we would love to. Absolutely. But it, I mean, as somebody who, who, you know, has been in that world yeah. and, and done whatever whatever i have right yeah it is definitely a a weird and uncomfortable thing for us to attend a traditional therapy mm -hmm. session yes. now you know there's lots of foundation stuff like that they'll, they'll do the hunting they'll do mm -hmm. yes. fishing expeditions yeah. that but having that being able to get you know for the military tricare or other insurance companies mm -hmm. to pay for um i think to pay for a deep in fitness 
uh, membership or even, yeah. even other things like, like yoga. I mean, imagine yeah. how, what the cost saving is mm -hmm. for, okay, I've got to send somebody to, now I'm going to medicate people. Now I'm going to do, mm -hmm. send them to a traditional therapy and stuff like that where, yeah. and we, we continue to do it, continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And we're not getting anywhere with it. Yeah. So instead, let me, let me invest in the person. Mm -hmm. Get them to deep in fitness, get them to yoga, get them to a CrossFit gym, mm -hmm. something yeah. to, to get them out of that, that rut that they're in. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's the only way you can do it because if, if one thing's not working and you continue to do it, that's just insane. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that, is, yeah? that is the definition, definition. of insanity. It really so, is. Yeah. I, um, I think that with building out these opportunities, it's also something that is neuroscience informed. Um, and it comes from the idea that people are going to be drawn towards and start to feel a part of and accepted by things that are familiar to their nervous system. So an unfamiliar environment is going to be a room alone with a stranger talking about your feelings. Yeah. Even though traditionally that's, we've seen that like, okay, this works for, for people in the long run. However, how can we create a bridge towards this experience where people have the opportunity to build a little bit more of a relationship with this idea of being vulnerable or this idea of kind of grappling with that internal dialogue. Right. Um, and I think that using a lot of these somatic therapy techniques create that conduit for these populations. Um, and it's it's um, neuroscience informed, and then there's a theory called polyvagal theory that I use a lot of that that really helps me to sort of guide my decision making and sort of like piecing together components of what I see in therapy, and then how to best help these populations. That's a pretty big word. It or, is. Or I know. Two, or two I know. words. I don't, I, know yeah. I, I don't know. I actually don't know which one that is. Polyvagal is one word. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So what is that then? So it is a theory. So it's just a theory, but it is this idea that. Um, within our nervous system, we have the parasympathetic state, and then we have the sympathetic state. Within that parasympathetic state, though, we have our body. Um, I'm trying to put this into layman's terms because I don't want to lose anyone. We have two ways that our body can flip back into this mode. One is where it's called a ventral vagal state. So we'll use ventral kind of synonymously with this idea of open. Okay. I can connect with people. There is no threat around me. The second parasympathetic state is where our body is still in threat detection mode. It's just not firing physiologically on the same cylinders that it is in the sympathetic, but it truly hasn't relaxed or allowed itself to reconnect with people. And that's called a dorsal vagal shutdown. In between those two is something called a, a vagal break. And so if we don't have access to the vagal break as humans, then we're going to edge into that shutdown, that dorsal vagal parasympathetic state. For me, and when you have populations that are training continuously to be in threat detection mode, they are continuously being told, like, you have to perform, you have to step up, you have to do these things. They're not fostering a relaxed state relationship. They're not mm. fostering that relationship with the parasympathetic ventral vagal. I'm open and connected. My friends are all wonderful. Like this is great. That's very hippie. Yeah, it's yeah, <laughs> it's it's a it's a it's and right it's very foreign very... to that area of work where it's like even when I'm not on the job, when I'm back with my friends, my family, what have you, I'm still in threat detection mode. I'm yeah. still a protector. I'm still somebody who has to be firing at all cylinders. So using that idea that we need to help people develop a relationship back with that relaxed state is where polyvagal theory comes in and sort of starts to potentially answer some questions about why do certain mental health issues become so pervasive in these careers where people are constantly in that threat detection hmm. mode. It is, so in that uh, vagal shutdown, mm -hmm. is that where the kind of anxiety lives? for people or is it in a different like because the way you yeah, were describing yeah. it yeah. goes if I, if i'm always if i'm constantly switched on mm -hmm. and, and just you know er, yeah may, and i'm i'm constantly worried about a threat yeah that seems like that would be a an anxiety yes uh, yes that is uh that is exactly it so 
phenomenal the just like identification there it is a product of the the sympathetic state okay so when we experience anxiety as an emotion inside out 2 did a pretty decent job addressing this there's a lot of cool resources <laughs> from that movie um but really the the source of anxiety for us as humans as an emotion is i feel threatened i now need to pay hyper attention to my surroundings so nothing hurts me I become hypervigilant or I start paying attention to nitpicky details. Um, and those are sort of the mental processing, um, that, that, that mental processing that happens where the thoughts start to get a little bit faster because I'm trying to detect a threat as quickly as possible. With a dorsal vagal shutdown, that parasympathetic state that is still trying to detect a threat, that's where we see more disconnection. So ebbing and flowing through the experience of anxiety and then into um, anhedonia, which is like a, a loss of connection with the things that we love. I used to love playing soccer and now whenever I see it on TV, nothing happens for me. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that would, that would that'd be an example of it. Um, and then, you know, potentially feelings of like depression or just being shut down, going home to family and not being able to connect with them. Hmm. And you're sitting there and you're beating yourself up like, I love my family. I love my kids. But right now I don't want to be around them yeah. at all. And a lot of that is not because we are horrible human beings, but because our nervous system is still stuck in this hyper threat detection mode. So where does like uh, adrenal fatigue fall into that? Oh, such a good question. I love this so much. So if we're continually in a threat detection state, the hormones that are pumping through our body pretty continuously are going to be our stress hormones. Okay. So that's going to be adrenaline, cortisol, a little bit of dopamine, dopamine, norepinephrine, really pumping on all cylinders. When we're in our parasympathetic ventral vagal hippie state, our, our relaxed right. state, that is actually where our sex hormone production comes back online and really starts pumping. So that's okay. our testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and the things that kind of help regain our connection and want to be with other people. And so if we are constantly in a threat detection state and we really can't access that open ventral vagal state, we experience something like adrenal fatigue. Your body just simply can't continually produce adrenaline, cortisol, dopamine on all cylinders at all times without that ability to plug in and recharge in that deeper parasympathetic state. Mm. In addition to that, it, it's, it starts to become an issue of, I feel more fatigued at my job. I'm not putting on muscle in the same way. I'm trying to do all of these things. And it's because we're blocking our body's access towards natural testosterone production. So in line with all of the mental health benefits that nervous system regulation brings, there's also a ton of physiological benefits for helping us regulate normally um, for both men and women. And, and it really starts to help us to feel better in our bodies and just better connected either in our jobs. And then when we leave, being able to connect meaningfully with things outside of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and so I'm going to tie some things here, Yes. but, but I'm going to need you to walk me through it. Yes. So with all of that parasympathetic stuff, all of that vagal shutdown, yes. all of that stuff, and then talking about deregulation mm -hmm. and using deep end fitness, yes. like, please connect that for me because I can't right now. Okay, and, okay. And if we were on video, yeah. people would totally be making fun of me right now, <laughs> comment, commenting like, dude, she has totally lost him. He, he hang, <laughs> like I'm hanging in there, but it's like, it's, know, it's barely, I'm, I'm like barely I know, there. I know. I'm, I, that is my lifelong goal is to become someone who can communicate to anyone about this because I think it's so important. So I mean, I'm, I'm there. I know. Okay. But, okay. but like, I want to tie in. Like, okay. So, so for the person that isn't necessarily going yes. through adrenal fatigue or, yeah. or maybe they have just lived with chronic anxiety for, mm -hmm. for most of their, their right. life, you know, through things that happen in childhood or yes. maybe yeah. into, like, how can deep in fitness help these people? I love this question so much. And we're going to zoom out for a second and come back to that phrase, somatic therapy techniques. Okay. So plugging back in with our body and being able to recognize how, what's really going on for us and how we're feeling. If we are someone who struggles and we continually feel anxious in our day-to-day -day life, we are stuck pretty high into that sympathetic state. We're, we've got overdrive going on there. So how now do I connect back to my parasympathetic state and how can deep end fitness help facilitate that? 
from a purely scientific perspective, when we have an imbalance of carbon dioxide in our body, we enter into a parasympathetic state. Naturally. Naturally. Okay. Carbon dioxide buildup in the body for whatever reason, there's theories that it's tied to the mammalian dive reflex, creates a calming sensation in the body. Hmm. Okay. So when we're doing a deep end fitness workout and we are holding our breath, we intake oxygen and a couple other gases, but predominantly oxygen. Our muscles are using that oxygen and then it puts off CO2. When we're holding our breath, our body can't release the CO2. Hmm. So we've created the imbalance of CO2 in the body through a breath hold. Then once we come to the surface, we're doing something like a bob or a sprint on the surface, or we're doing some burpees on the deck. We are elevating our heart rate and then mimicking, sort of tapping into a baseline sympathetic state. So deep end fitness as a workout ebbs and flows between the two states, creating a regulatory path. The experience of having your body being able to ebb and flow between that parasympathetic and sympathetic state strengthens that vagal break that we were talking about and helping the body get into that open ventral vagal state. So this is a somatic therapy of the body technique to get the nervous system to calm down. It is not the only way. So if we're looking at trying to access the parasympathetic state, there's a myriad of other modalities that can do that. At Deep End Fitness, we're really using that carbon dioxide buildup to help you access that and then help you play back and forth between the two states. Yeah, because you guys, the way you designed it is definitely... Um... It, it, it's a wave yeah. there. There's definitely, mm-hmm. it's, it's not a, mm-hmm. it's not a, all of a sudden we're going to rock it up to, to this level yeah. and we're going to, we're going to plateau and maintain this level Yes. throughout the, uh, the session this morning. It was yeah. definitely, there was an ebb, ebb and, and flow, flow mm-hmm. throughout the entire thing. Exactly. That way to not, to not <laughs> jack us up and just keep us there. Yes. Yeah. So our workouts wouldn't be written like where we have a, a hundred burpee buy-in and then we have oh, you do God. like a two minute static hold. Oh. That's, that's, that's not the, the goal for deep end that fitness. That sounds terrible. By the which way. also, and I'm so curious and I hope that one day I can contribute research in this area, but for HIIT workouts, high intensity interval training, we have a tendency to get pretty high into that sympathetic and then ride the lightning for a long period of time (laughs) in that, yeah, yeah. in that, in that high sympathetic state. And then theoretically we're able to crash down, right? Our body's like, okay, the stress is over. I'm down into my parasympathetic state. I have a theory though, that people who are already experiencing chronic stress in their work life, if they add on a stressful workout are continuing the stress cycle. Yeah. There's, they're continuing the amount of time that they're just not accessing that parasympathetic and they're just adding in a dash of dopamine and norepinephrine. So they're like, I feel great. And you're like, do you, do you really? <laughs> well, that only lasts for so long. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Like that. And I think that people that do end up liking and finding those workouts ultimately at some point, maybe potentially experience adrenal fatigue or a crash yeah. or like, wow, I can't even look at a barbell for a while. Like that's, that's a wild ride. Whereas workouts that allow you to tap into both are going to really help you build a relationship and an understanding of when your body is in different yeah. physiological places. Yeah. We've, so there was only one time that I can think of that I kind of experienced that in terms of the kind of, when you're standing on the back of the ramp, yeah. About to jump out, you know, yes. it's, it's yeah. 20,000 feet, whatever. Yeah. And you're, you're at night, you're fully kitted up. You should be jacked up a bit. No, not, yes. and I, I yeah. don't, I don't mean like, Oh my God, what, mm-hmm. like what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, just a shot of adrenaline. You'd be like, yes. all right, cool. Yeah. There was a point where I was getting where it was that wasn't like I was getting very complacent mm-hmm. and I wouldn't get jacked up. Mm-hmm. And, and I, that's when I like, the good thing is I recognize that mm-hmm. I was like, okay, well I need to, I need to give this a break for a little yes. bit yeah, because that's not normal. Yeah. It is not normal to be at, at 25,000 feet looking out in, into the blackness mm-hmm. uh, of a dark ramp with, with a bunch of dudes behind me about ready to jump out and me just be like, eh, yeah, it's casual. Whatever. I'm no going to tweet deal. from here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like that's not right. 
Yes. So that is a, a point where we have become sort of desensitized to the stimulus that usually elicits an, a sympathetic response. Where we can start to play is that desensitization, right? So taking a break from that stimulus and having that be a more a part of the awareness in those exercises of, okay, are my guys experiencing severe desensitization? Do we need to take a break from this so they can recalibrate? A, and B, when they're in that sympathetic state, when they get that shot of adrenaline, are they able to bring cognitive functioning online, stay here in their prefrontal cortex, or do they go into like a, almost a prey response mode of that adrenaline shot was too much. I've got vasoconstriction going on. Like my blood vessels are there and I can't think. Yeah. Right. And so we have that opportunity too with those moments in understanding the sympathetic state towards how do I get people into a challenge stress response. So that stress response of I'm dialed, I'm ready to go. I can think as opposed to a threat stress response of, oh, I feel like prey and I got to get the hell out of here. And that is another sort of really wonderful aspect of deep end fitness is that when we do the breath hold and we're tapping into that CO2 imbalance, inherently it gives us a practice rep with wrestling that panic moment. So even though we're creating for our bodies the CO2 imbalance and we're sitting there and our body's going to start relaxing, we still have a mental moment of, wow, I'm holding my breath and this is scary. You get to practice using the internal dialogue to dial in and say, it's tough, but I'm okay here. And that is the type of internal dialogue that helps elicit a challenge stress response. So the moment that it becomes time to jump, to do what have you, whatever skill in front of you, you instead are, oh, I know exactly what to do. Let's go. Yeah. I think that's, I think that ties into like what we call, and I don't, I don't know if, if, if it's a correct terminology, but we call it stress inoculation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so in terms of, I'm going to provide a certain amount of stress mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. your life, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's applied in an academic setting, applied yeah. in a, hey, a pool session, yeah. a, a smoke session yes. or something like that. Yes. And because one for our job, we've, we've got to figure out if you're going to buckle, like yep. if, if you're going to run, because you're no good to us if, if, if you're running. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but at the same, you know, if, if you're going to shut down, you know, I, I yeah. know we're, nobody knows this, but we're, you know, outside right yeah. now, you know, if something happened, yeah. you know, a car wreck or something like that, like the expectation, like, it's not even a question. I'm going over there. Yes. Yeah. But that's not everybody. Yeah. That's the, you know, cause they, Some people have something, a threat stress right. And they're yeah. going to they're shut down yeah. and we can't have that. So it's a, it's yeah. a stress inoculation Yes. Uh, to do that. Yes. Absolutely. So with the stress inoculation, if they were like, Laura, we're going to hire you on to help us make this a more complete experience for our tactical athletes, I would be like, let's go. I'm so ready for this. So the first aspect that I would add in to stress inoculation training would be a practice, a diligent practice beforehand about what it looks like to have an internal dialogue that's going to help shift you in that direction. A healthy one, not a, uh, uh, yes. not, <laughs> not one that, that we talk about where it's like, <laughs> well, I just call myself a fat piece of shit. Like, I, I usually, for the way that I like to engage tactical athletes in this way is I'm like, I want you to anchor into your why. And for a lot of them, they, they anchor into that place of, I know that I am born to protect, right? It comes from this deep deep, deep desire and alignment of protection. And when we can tap into that and we can tap into the desire, the fulfillment of being a protector, we can start to gear the internal dialogue of like, how do I execute that? How do I become a protector in this moment? And so that would be at the outset before a drill. After a stress inoculation drill, I would Really love to see a down regulation practice, mm. something put in place to help the tactical athletes reconnect with a parasympathetic straight, uh, state after being exposed to stress, because that's going to teach them how to regulate, which is so important. I know that in general, there is this idea of you need to be able to endlessly endure. However, <laughs> That's not um, an ideology that is informed by neuroscience or our physiology. To be tactical athletes who are able to perform at the top of their game for a long period of time, you need to know how to ebb and flow between the oh, two yeah. states. Yes. So, okay, then what yeah. is a good practice 
that that anybody mm-hmm. or I mean we I mean we can we can tailor it to people that yeah for deep in fitness but just in yeah. general yeah what is a good practice or exercise to help deregulate yes if they if somebody finds themselves where it's just an yeah. overwhelming maybe it's not anxiety maybe it is anxiety yeah but it's just an overwhelming situation and it's like okay I need to take five seconds yeah. And, and and maybe it's just some some real quick breath work, mm-hmm. and I don't mean like, yeah. hey, there's going back to our accident, our car accident. I don't mean sitting here and just kind of like, okay, now I'll go no. over there, you know, really yeah. really getting zen and out yeah. and going over. But but I mean, you it, like your heart rate gets jacked mm-hmm. fast, mm-hmm. and you got to be able to recognize that and realize that now I'm becoming a liability. Yes, you yeah. know, and, and now somebody's going to have to come in here and rescue me <laughs> if I don't. If I don't yeah. fix this real quick, yeah. so what's a what's a, a good practice to help downregulate? So, at the core of all downregulation and tapping into that parasympathetic state is a feeling of safety. What creates safety for people, to me, and I, I think I differ from a lot of professionals in my field, is subjective. I think a lot of people think, oh, like a hug from a friend, it's an objective way to feel safe, and I'm like, you. I, I'm like, I'm not going to pitch that to the guys that I, like are my clients I mean, right we, now. We are huggers. So <laughs> we are. But. Um, so I, coming to that core idea of safety and then figuring out how to integrate that into a, for lack of a better phrase, like a post-stress inoculation ritual. So let's say right now, if we were to take something from like the law enforcement field and we were to say debriefs are a, a part of we have a stressful occurrence and then we have a debrief afterwards. If safety is at the core of that and we allow for the space for people to either talk about their experience, feel seen, heard, um, come back to a way or like a maybe a breathwork practice for safety, maybe even just having a moment to think about what it feels like to feel safe. Right. Just reconnecting with that helps people to come down out of that sympathetic, I'm jacked up and firing on all cylinders mode. Um, at Deep End Fitness, we open and close our classes with the circle of trust. And so opening really helps to create, for me especially as the lead instructor on the deck, a sense of trust and safety. When I'm asking someone to go down in the pool and hold their breath, they've had the opportunity to look me in the eyes before that and say, okay, I, I trust her. Like, she's kind of jacked. I, I think she can come get me <laughs> from the bottom of the pool. Um, at the end of the session, when we're together and we're sort of talking about our experience and what we got out of it today, that is a practice that is anchored in the idea of I'm safe to talk about what happened for me in the water. I'm, I, I feel safe in telling the people that are here with me and I feel supported. And then you leave really deeply connected to that parasympathetic yeah. state. So that's sort of how we end every single session in order to help people tap into that experience. And then you start realizing you do it in other areas of your life. Like I'll have a really stressful workout now with somebody where we kind of went, we went after it in the training session. And my first question is going to be, how was that for you? Like, where was the hairy part of that? And reaching for connection after doing something arduous and difficult, which for me has been a game changer in my own training practice for sure. Yeah, that was that was kind of the the interesting part of it is I because this was my first deep in fitness session. Yeah, you know? um, and so having that kind of gratitude circle beforehand, mm-hmm. gratitude circle afterwards, yeah. uh, was good because it 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 does help bring in a a bit of community like that. Yeah, like, like so when we talk about our selections, yeah, yeah you, you take 140 people mm-hmm. right off the bat, you're not going to know everybody, but just give it a couple of days, and we start whittling those numbers down like really fast. Yeah. Yeah. But you start to get to know know people and and bond with them. And yeah. although we're not doing that in selection, because that right there doesn't have a place in our selection, not and not in the selection, but, yes. But in in this, mm-hmm. uh, it was great. Yeah. It's great, yeah. and you get to you get to connect with people on a yeah. on a different level than just in inside the pool. Yeah, and it's awesome. And, and hearing you know where they're from and and like oh, okay, this guy is going to be a firefighter. You know, Stephen earlier was going to go try out to be a PJ mm-hmm. up at the California. I know. Like, fantastic. Mm-hmm. But like, the boy, that was awkward for me. He's, <laughs> he's, like, he's like, hey, dude, what, what's up, man? I'm going to be a PJ. I'm like, oh, God. There's a whole lot of expectation of me now. <laughs> this Can't is not good. Yeah, I'm like, this is great. 
Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, and I agree with that. And I think that that is the sort of like respectful part of, again, working with these communities and understanding that selection exists for a reason. And it's, it's not to coddle, coddle you in the process. It's about to see like, okay, we have to whittle the numbers down. We have to pick and choose the guys who are going to be able to uphold the standard. Yep. How do we get there? At the back end of that, once you have your guys, that's when you would want to start putting in training practices to help them be in this in the field in their job designation for as long as possible and to be as good as they can be in those positions. Yeah. And and the uh the gratitude part, I tell you what, in in uh have you ever heard of a guy named Dr. Preston Klein? No. So I know he's friends with Prime yeah. as well, but he is like deep in the the SOCOM world, the special operations yeah. world in terms of doing studies on that. And yeah. and we actually just had him out here for two days doing doing work with us. And part of it was the the gratitude kind of thing, which again, we're we're already we've already, you know, quote unquote made it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it was it was interesting to see that kind of aspect of yeah. it compared to what we weren't doing before yes and and like i um i'm always going to probably come back to this so sorry if it's nerdy but but the neuroscience lens of that is like when you have very rudimentary and scheduled gratitude practices you tap into that part of the brain where we know that neurons that fire together wire together so you're creating like a, a pathway a deeply ingrained pathway in your brain that is held together with those practices that are scheduled, um, where you're gonna automatically want to express gratitude for things. And and that to me is also how you start helping people in this field um, tap into a, a greater sense of mental health while they're performing their jobs. They can maintain a feeling of gratitude while also doing something difficult, while loving discomfort. And that's that's where you want your athletes to be. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it, it going back to your safe, you know, having a, a safety net, I yeah. think that, helps at least start the conversation mm-hmm. of somebody being able to go, Hey, I, I'm not right yeah. right now. Mm-hmm. And I may not be the right guy to go on this deployment or, mm-hmm. or I may, because then I'm a liability to mm-hmm. myself and my team yeah. or like, Hey, I'm really going through some shit right now. Yeah. And I, I don't know who to talk to, but yeah. I feel comfortable with you. So let me, let yeah. me talk, you know, and I think that that is the beginning of that, mm-hmm. that to kind of yeah. to break down that barrier. Yeah. And I think that that is such an important part of a leadership role is, is do your, do your guys feel safe coming to you and expressing those things? So that way you can put the team that is going to be able to execute out into the world. Yeah. Um, and so in order to have those honest, vulnerable conversations where somebody can express that, like there has to be that safety there. So again, even tacking it on to who am I as a leader? Can I create a safe environment? Um, that is, to me, going to be a very important part of, of watching teams develop, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I don't want to get out in front of my skis here. Uh, <laughs> and I definitely don't want to put you in an in a awkward situation. Right? Yeah. Um, but we had kind of alluded to, before we started recording, yeah. we kind of alluded to some of the things that Deep End Fitness is one to get after. Yeah. And like I said, I... I don't want to put you in a precarious situation, but I, yeah. I would love to at least hint yeah. at the kind of things that Deep End Fitness yeah. are, are getting after yes. here in the very near future, fingers crossed. Yes. So I love this because I get to talk about it, but also just sort of leave some room for growth and development. Um, the first is really getting Operation Resilience up and running, which is going to be an opportunity for veterans in the community, potentially even active military members, uh, first responders to come together and have an experience with Deep End Fitness, an opportunity to connect, to meet uh, people with similar stories, to, to share and, and really have that support and community. Uh, in addition to Operation Resilience, something that I'm personally working on is an opportunity for deep end sessions to be a group therapy modality. And so that individuals can come out re- regularly and really work on the, the internal dialogue, the, the camaraderie and the connection and the safety that comes with deep end fitness, uh, through the conduit of group therapy. And so I think that having those 
accessible within our organiza organization and in terms of the communities that we're going to be able to help and develop. I just, I see so many opportunities opening up and I, I'm really excited about that. No, that's awesome. Yeah. So right now we're calling call it operational resilience. Yes. Operational okay. resilience is the uh, more like, let's get an experience together for people who want to come out and do this. And then the more uh, structured, scheduled, more group therapy is going to be something that I'll be running um, as a as an AMFT and, and future MFT. As a like a practitioner. Yeah, right? yeah, okay. as a clinician. Yeah, yeah. You could see a lot of my face. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Has has this ever been done in this fashion? Like this, this is to yeah. me, this is such a new thing. Like, like we yeah. talked about, there's, there's the hunting and the fishing yeah. and that kind of stuff, which is great yeah. because there's, there's great Americans that are, that are out there that want to take care of yeah. veterans, law enforcement, firefighters, yeah. and they just, you know, it's tough, it's tough yeah. to, to, they want to give back. Mm -hmm. They want to say thank you. Yes. And it's tough. Yes. Right. Because yeah. you're like, well, what do you, what do you do? You yeah. know, I can, I can give jobs. I can donate to, to charities and that kind of stuff, but yeah. sometimes it doesn't feel like enough. So yeah. has, has any, does anything like what you're getting after exist? No. Uh, the short answer so is it's, no. So it's yeah. a challenge. So right. it's, it's new and I am carving out the path for this to exist. And my hope is that in the work that I do in establishing it, it becomes replicable for other modalities. So I obviously love deep end fitness. I'm a huge fan of it. I think that it's a conduit towards immense mental health growth and improvement. Um, it's deep end fitness isn't the only modality that can accomplish this. Mm -hmm. And so in the work and the sort of precedent that I want to set, I want other people to feel empowered and say, oh, I understand that through this practice, People in this field can also achieve mental health improvement and growth. I'd like to replicate in another way. So setting and and kind of like taking on the project of creating this is going to hopefully open up just a number of different methodologies and and ways that people can can access mental health in a new way that might be a little bit more familiar, might feel a little bit more comfortable, and might yield better results. Yeah. No, I agree. And and I'm glad that you said that it's it's not solely based off of deep fit or yeah. that deep in fitness is not the only way to do it. Yeah. Because until we can get like, you know, two or three of deep in fitness in every city, yeah. like it's just not realistic. Yes, yeah. I mean, let's let's work on that. Yeah. Like, let's get yeah. that as a goal. Oh yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you know, unfortunately I, I still mm -hmm. haven't been able to make it to the deep in fitness Las Vegas yeah. just because of, you know, well, that's an excuse. I could, I could have made it. I just don't want to get punished by Maki. That's all it is. <laughs> so, yep. um, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down uh, and chat with me about yeah. this. And and especially thanks for letting me join you guys this morning. Yeah. Uh, it was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for yeah. coming out. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to keeping you updated on all the progress we made. No, it's great because yeah. I like whatever we want to do, like we, we like everything that deep in fitness and, and all the coaches yeah. are, are doing and especially getting after operational resilience, whenever that gets up and running, like, like come back on or, or, or yeah. maybe, you know, Don and prime come back on yeah. or whoever, even yeah. Paul, if he wants to, but I'll tell you what, <laughs> Paul was singing your praise. Cause I was like, Paul, are you going to join us? He's like, no, no. He's like, Laura, Laura's got it. She said she's able to articulate it way better. Than I, like, All right, man. Well, oh, hey, dude, open invite. But, um, but no, I, I really yeah. appreciate it. We we would love to to continue to praise everything that you guys are doing. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. That means the, that means the world. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and leave us a review. Uh, and we're out here later. <laughs>